Hi, welcome back to Intro to Biology for Majors. This is the Chapter 17 PowerPoint from your OpenStax book, Biology 2E, and Chapter 17 covers biotechnology and genomics. So we'll start off with our objectives, and there are three of them. So first, we want to start off by recognizing the requirements for generating transgenic organisms. We also want to be able to recognize the significance of genetically modified organisms in society. And we want to be able to define the seven components of biotechnology, which are PCR, stem cells, cloning, DNA sequencing, DNA probes, PGD, and gene therapy. And we'll go over all of those in extent on this PowerPoint. Okay, so first things first, I'd like to talk about biotechnology and what it is. So biotechnology is the use of biological agents for technological advancement. So the use of living agents for the advancement of technology. Um, farmers and ranchers used artificial, artificial selection to breed livestock and crops long before the scientific basis of these techniques was actually understood. So years before scientists began using this in labs, uh, farmers were actually using it out in the fields. And we're going to start off by talking about DNA. Uh, DNA stores the information that the cell needs to produce proteins, regulatory molecules, tRNA, and rRNA. Scientists can manipulate DNA. So they can copy it. They can sequence it, which basically means they can read it. Um, they can switch it on and off. They can probe for different pieces of DNA, and they can even transfer it between species. Manipulating DNA for practical purposes is called DNA technology or biotechnology. So now I'd like to talk about transgenic organisms. So a transgenic organism is an organism whose genome contains recombinant DNA. And recombinant DNA is genetic material from another species. So recombinant means kind of reorganizing. So you can think of it that way. It's reorganizing DNA from another species into a species that we're working with. So transgenic organisms have many useful applications like manufacturing pharmaceuticals, so medicines that we use every day, engineering hardy crops, um, better crops for our food supply, and testing human genetic diseases in mice. Also bioluminescent genes, uh, so genes that glow in the dark, produce a fluorescent protein so that the cells will glow. These have been transferred into a variety of organisms for scientific purposes. So I have an image over here that kind of shows you uh, the, pro the process of creating a transgenic organism. Um, so here we have a holding needle uh, attached to a small cell where um, you see that there's a pronucleus, there's a female pronucleus, a male pronucleus, um, and polar bodies. And we're taking some DNA from the outside, so from a different organism, we're inserting it into the male pronucleus here, which is then inserted into this mouse. So for example, this DNA may come from another mouse. It may come from a white mouse of a different color. It may come from a totally different animal or organism. Um, and it can actually be put into a cell, which is then um, transferred into a um, living organism like a mouse, for example. So it looked easy in the last slide, but let's kind of talk about recombination um, and what that really means. So in recombination, we acquire DNA to insert into a new organism. So we take DNA from one organism, or what I'll say is organism A, to put it into organism B. So to do that, we obtain what's called a plasmid, and a plasmid is a circle of double-stranded DNA. So in this image that I'm showing you here, this circle originally is a plasmid. That's what's labeled here. The entire circle is called a plasmid. So that's what we actually take from organism A um, in order to put it into organism B. So we take this circle of DNA, we cut the plasmid with enzymes. So right here, we'll take two enzymes and cut on this spot to remove this gene. So we cut the plasmid with enzymes. The source DNA combines with the plasmid. So then we use a small zap of electricity to insert recombinant DNA. Um, so we'll actually insert this new gene, this DNA, into the plasmid itself. So that takes a little zap of electricity to insert it um, into recipient cells, for example, bacteria. And the recipient cells that can produce the proteins encoded by the new genes, um, since all the organisms share the same genetic code. So the recipient cell can produce the proteins encoded 
by these new genes that we inserted. So that's how we recombine or that's how we go through recombination. We take a plasmid, we um, are able to cut that plasmid open using enzymes, we can insert a new gene. Um, and basically that's how we have recombinant DNA as a whole. And this is still a plasmid, it's just the plasmid with that added gene. So some of the notes that I have here are placing a recombinant plasmid within bacteria is the common method for inserting DNA. So restriction enzymes are proteins that do the work of cutting the plasmid. So when we're talking about cutting the plasmid here to insert a new gene, those are restriction enzymes. And when I spoke about bacteria here, we use that small zap of electricity, which will insert the recombinant DNA into recipient cells, which often we use bacteria uh, and then that bacteria is given to organism B, for example. So recombinant DNA is composed of a combination of DNA nucleotides from two or more organisms. So basically recombinant means recombining. So we're combining genes from a different organism or organism A into recombinant DNA that will then be inserted through bacteria into organism B. So in the last slide, we talked about recombination we talked about how we take a plasmid, we insert new genes from a different organism, and we often put them in bacteria for use, whether it be biomedical or in farming. So let's kind of talk more about genetically modified bacteria and what it's used for today. So one of the main things that we see genetically modified bacteria being used for today is the, produ uh, the production of human insulin for diabetic patients. So this image here will actually show you that process and um, the process is basically placement of the human insulin genetic code into bacteria. It's the current method of producing insulin for type one and type two diabetics. Um, so in this image, we have a bacteria with its plasmid here that holds all of its genetic code. Um, we have restriction enzymes like we talked about in the last slide with our plasmid, they're cutting that plasmid. We are inserting that red human insulin gene. So we're inserting a new gene putting it back into that genetically modified bacteria now. And the insulin protein is now in all of these bacterias. We go through the process of fermentation, we purify, and then in the end of the process, we end up with insulin that's ready for distribution to patients. So this is used in um, biomedical research all the time. We also use genetically modified bacteria for things like clotting factor for people who are hemophiliacs, so who don't have a natural clotting mechanism within their physiology. Um, we use it for fertility hormones for women attempting pregnancy, and we even use it for things like artificial sweetener. Um, and lastly, farmers actually do use um, GMOs or what we call genetically modified organisms uh, to produce more drought resistant crops. So crops that are hardy and they're able to kind of last through a drought season rather than losing an entire crop. So genetically modified bacteria is used in a wide variety of scientific research today. So now I'd like to talk about the seven components used in biotechnology and genomics. So I'm going to list the seven components for you here, and then we're going to have slides covering each one. They're all color coordinated if you need to go back through. Um, but let's start with we have PCR, which uh, takes place with short tandem repeats, and we'll find out that's of DNA, but it's PCR. Um, number two would be stem cells. Number three would be cloning. Number four is DNA sequencing. Five is DNA probes. Six is PGD or pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, and seven is gene therapy. And these don't go in a specific order. Basically, these are the way that scientists work within biotechnology, especially for biomedical research. Um, so this is a really interesting part of the slideshow. We're gonna dig deeper into each one of these. And remember, these are one of your objectives is to remember the seven components and also how they work. Okay, so number one of your seven components is the PCR. Um, which uses short tandem repeats. So what if investigators only have a tiny amount of DNA to examine? So I like to give the example um, of a true crime investigation. What if there's a murder or something happens where investigators are able to collect DNA, but they only have a small amount of that DNA? It might be useful to replicate the DNA using polymerase chain reactions, which is PCR, using rapid replication without a living organism. So basically a PCR takes that small amount of DNA and it's able to use rapid replication without like a living organism or a person. It just takes from the original DNA. PCR separates DNA strands. It uses enzymes to replicate each strand 
and then it repeats that process, creating millions of copies in just minutes. Investigators will use PCR and DNA sequencing to detect genetic differences between individuals. And each individual has a unique pattern of what we call short tandem repeats or STRs, uh, short repeated sequences of DNA. So that's how we'll be able to distinguish individuals. So the PCR components listed here, this here would be called a thermocycler. Um, so the PCR components are a sample of DNA. We have to have primers. We have the nucleotides within DNA, so A, T, G, and C. We have something called TAC polymerase, a buffer, and a PCR tube. So all of these things exist within the PCR tube and they go through a thermocycler and then they go through the PCR cycle or they go through the um, polymerase chain reaction cycle. So PCR, the main thing here is that a PCR can make millions of copies of a sample of DNA that's very small and a tabletop machine in just a couple of hours. So it's able to create millions of copies in a couple of hours rather than having to process it with that very limited amount of DNA, we can have more DNA to use. So this is PCR continued. So once we enter the PCR process, first DNA polymerase, nucleotides and primers, which we kind of mentioned in the last slide, are combined with the target sequence of DNA. Then the mixture is heated up which causes the DNA to naturally separate. Uh, we actually call that denaturing. So this is the original strand. It goes through denaturing where it heats up to 95 Celsius, for example. The strands will then naturally separate from each other. When the mixture cools off, primers will attach to the naked or separated DNA strands. So that's called annealing. When a primer will attach, it's called annealing, which is this process. So primers bind the template strand and since it is stable at a high temperature, what we call TAC DNA polymerase enzyme replicates the strand starting at that primer. So that happens here. We have the original DNA strand, we have the primer, and TAC DNA is going to synthesize a new strand that's called an extension. So basically this is the process, uh, one cycle of the process of PCR taking an original small strand of DNA and replicating it hundreds and thousands of times and to millions of times. So this is a very extensive process. It works over just a couple of hours and it's able to solve a lot of crimes today. It's also able to just recognize individuals because like we stated in the last slide, we all have very um, identifying stand uh, standard repeats, uh, short tandem repeats within our DNA. So this side really just shows you the PCR components and the PCR process side by side. So these are all the components that go into the machine. Um, this would be the thermocycler that pushes the PCR cycle. We go through denaturing where the strands will separate. The primers then bind to that template of the open DNA. So we have primers here and primers here. And then through extension, we synthesize a new strand with that TAC polymerase. Uh, so we're able to make now two strands of DNA rather than the one. And that happens millions and millions of times until we have a much larger um, portion of DNA to work with. And we're able to really identify those short tandem repeats of an individual. So now I wanna move on from PCR and we're gonna talk about stem cells. Um, so stem cells can often be um, um, something that sparks public debate within people because if you don't know much about stem cells, stem cells actually come from embryonic individuals or uh, embryonic organisms. So it's basically the moment that the egg is fertilized with the sperm, they create something called a blastocyst. And um, that is to some people the very spark of life, to others not, but regardless of that, stem cells are very important for biological research. Um, they're important because these blastocyst cells, these stem cells that we're talking about here, have the potential to differentiate into any other type of cell in the body. So if you really think about the process of fertilization, the egg and the sperm combine, and they start off as what we call a blastocyst. This is the very beginning of um, the embryonic cycle or process. And within this process, these cells have to become everything within the human body. They become your stomach, your heart, your eyes, your hands, um, your skin, everything. So these cells have the potential to differentiate into any cell type. Um, embryonic stem cells give rise to all cell types in the body. 
stem cells are important tools for biological research because of their potential to differentiate into these cells. Um, if we pulled from an adult who has cells for their heart, their, um, their lungs, their stomach, their blood cells, um, those cells are already what they are meant to be. They are not going to change. If we have the potential to use blastocyst cell, these young stem cells, they can be turned into any type of cell uh, for biomedical research. Um, so for example, we have ectoderm here, which is a neuron within the brain, mesoderm, which is your blood cells, and then even endoderm, your liver, your liver cells. So these stem cells that start off in the very early process of um, fertilization and an embryonic organism here, um, they have to be able to create everything in your body. So stem cells are important for research, um, but they can be a, a public debate topic. Okay, so now let's talk about cloning. And if you've uh, ever looked into cloning before, this is an image here on the left of Dolly the sheep. So Dolly the sheep is a real sheep. She was a product of what we call somatic cell nuclear transfer. This process involves uh, removing what we call a haploid nucleus. So a one in haploid, we've talked about before, a nucleus of an egg and replacing it with the diploid nucleus of a different donor cell. So then, Dolly is born as a complete clone of that donor cell. So cloning produces organisms containing exactly identical DNA. So rather than her being an individual, she's actually a clone of her quote unquote mother. So cloning or asexual uh, reproduction is common among single celled organisms like bacteria, archaea, and many protists. So it happens all the time in single celled organisms. But cloning is a lot less common in multicellular organisms, such as ourselves. Um, researchers have cloned mammals, which Dolly is an example of, using a method called somatic cell nuclear transfer. An adult sheep's DNA was extracted and put into another sheep's egg cell. After developing from an embryo, Dolly the sheep was born as an exact clone. Human cloning could help infertile parents have children, and could be used to harvest embryonic stem cells, but obviously there are ethical issues surrounding cloning of our own species. Um, so yeah, that's something that you need to know, uh, something that is a spark for debate today, but um, it is possible to clone mammals. Uh, Dolly is a perfect example. Okay, so this is our fourth component of biotechnology and genomics. This is DNA sequencing. So in DNA sequencing, we use something called gel electrophoresis, which is this entire process that you see in the image. Um, so gel electrophoresis here is used to separate DNA fragments, fluorescent labels, so labels that glow, and computers make sequencing that DNA a simple process. And some of the current purposes for DNA sequencing using gel electrophoresis are predicting protein sequencing, comparing DNA sequences between uh, uh, humans and other species, and comparing uh, sequences from extinct species as well. So basically gel electrophoresis is a technique used to separate DNA fragments by their size. So in this image, this um, blue area is actually a gel uh, that can be produced in a lab or you can actually purchase these gels. They have what we call wells, which are these whole uh, type things here in the top and using a pipetter like we've seen uh, in our lab we actually insert uh, a sample of DNA and the large samples will filter through using electro so we use an electro we use like an electric current um, to allow the cells or the DNA to move through the gel and the larger fragments have a harder time moving through that gel so they'll stay towards the top uh, the smaller fragments though have an easier time moving through the gel so they end up at the bottom. It's a lot like molecules moving through um, any other kind of membrane. So the gel acts as that membrane. So we have a positive electrode here, a negative in the plastic frame, and basically that current allows the DNA to move through this gel, and we end up with images like this. So this is a, a little nice image for you of what DNA sequencing actually looks like at the end. Um, this is also an image for you showing where we talked about um, the fluorescent label markers. So the labels here, these white labels in the black and white, and then the labels right here are fluorescent. So we're able to see them. Um, so the correct steps are collection, extraction, PCR, and electrophoresis. So a well-defined line of DNA on a gel like this, the well-defined purple lines are called a band of DNA. Each band contains a large number of DNA fragments that travel as a group to the same position. 
By comparing the bands in a simple or in a sample to the DNA ladder, we can determine their approximate sizes. Um, so there's only uh, one number uh, shown less than 800, which would travel past. Um, DNA sequencing actually reveals the order of nucleotides in DNA. So this is how we're able to distinguish between humans and other species and also between extinct species. And DNA sequencing is used in biomedical research all the time today. So now let's talk about DNA probes, which is the fifth um, process in the biotechnology and genomics list that we're going through. So DNA probes, it says many medical tests and procedures use DNA technology. For example, for example, a doctor might use a DNA probe to test whether a patient inherited a, something like cystic fibrosis allele. Um, probes are used to test for hemophilia, LFS, sickle cell, uh, like we said, cystic fibrosis. So a DNA probe is a single-stranded sequence created to bind a complementary region of DNA, such as the cystic fibrosis allele. So the probe is labeled with one of those fluorescent tags that we've talked about with DNA sequencing that shine. Um, the researcher can then detect whether the allele uh, is present using the wavelength emitted by the probe that they're using. DNA probes can also test for genetic diseases um, in a child or an adult. So basically, we're able to take a genetic sample from a patient, and then using what we call a DNA probe, we're able to um, insert the probe into that sample of DNA, and it will bind only, it will only shine or bind if the allele that it's looking for is present. So if someone is positive for cystic fibrosis, hemophilia, sickle cell, um, this DNA probe will bind with that region of DNA showing that they are positive. So that's how DNA uh, probes are used today in medical research. Okay, so now let's talk about PGD, which stands for pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. This is also much more well known as in vitro fertilization. So um, couples going through a hard time um, getting pregnant will have the potential to go through in vitro. So that is this process, PGD. Um, so pre-implantation genetic diagnosis uses DNA probes to reduce the odds of having a child with a genetic disease in this example. So first, a man's sperm fertilizes uh, several of a woman's egg within a laboratory dish. This is the process of in vitro. And then um, basically researchers will then extract DNA from one cell of each of those embryos. They will amplify it using a PCR, like what we talked about before. Um, then they will use these DNA probes, which we just talked about, to search for any kind of harmful alleles. Um, if an embryo lacks a genetic disease, then it's a good candidate for being implanted into the woman's uterus. So this isn't the actual process of in vitro, but this is what happens when um, couples are going through in vitro. They will fertilize multiple um, eggs, and then researchers will do this process in order to make sure that they are um, inserting the most healthy um, egg that they or embryo that they have created into the woman's uterus for um, the best chance of a healthy birth. So this is what we call, again, PGD. Uh, using DNA probes, like we discussed in the last slide, uh, we reduce the odds of having uh, genetic diseases within children within the process of in vitro fertilization by extracting DNA from the embryos, amplifying it with a PCR, and then using those probes to search for harmful alleles. Um, then we're able to decide which of the uh, resulting embryo uh, information is best to insert into the woman's uterus for the actual pregnancy process. Okay, so this slide is our last component. It's number seven. It's the last component of biotechnology and genomics. So this is gene therapy. So gene therapy may actually someday provide new treatment options for genetic diseases by replacing a faulty gene within a person's cells. So obviously um, a lot of biotechnology um, is uh, a trigger for many people and their beliefs, gene therapy being one of them. Um, PGD we just talked about is something that, you know, is, is controversial. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of controversy within biotechnology, but there's also a lot of um, potential for wonderful results for patients and people going through um, difficult diseases, people going through difficulty with pregnancy. Um, there are a lot of positive results. So with gene therapy, there are negative side effects potentially, 
it could trigger an unwanted immune response within the body because if a gene is inserted within a cell that our body doesn't recognize, we can have an immune response that would try to kill off that cell, that gene. Um, it could also insert a gene at the incorrect location within the body causing an issue, uh, which could also cause something like a tumor causing cancer. Um, and it can also create too much of a specific protein uh, product. So for example, cystic fibrosis, this is an example of how gene therapy may work. Cystic fibrosis is caused by a faulty gene on chromosome seven. So the result is an abnormal, what we call CFTR protein in our lung cells. Healthy versions of the gene are placed inside of the virus, which we use as a method to insert the new genes into the body. So uh, healthy versions of the gene are inserted into a virus, which then the patient inhales, uh, which sounds contradictory, but it actually works. The virus injects that genomic material, including the healthy gene, into those lung cells. So that healthy gene is now in those diseased lungs. And then the lung cells now have that gene available to produce normal CFTR proteins. So in turn, potentially reversing the effects of cystic fibrosis within that patient. Um, so this image here just kind of shows you what I just stated in gene therapy. It shows you a cell with a non-functioning gene, um, adding DNA containing a functional version of the gene here. So within the virus, we would have, um, which we use a virus because viruses are naturally able to penetrate our body. Um, so it makes it easier for that virus to enter the body um, of someone with CF, for example, um, and then work within the body. So basically, we're inserting a healthy version of that gene into this cell. And then now the cell has the information it needs to create that gene um, on its own and kind of reverse those side effects. So lastly, I want to talk about um, transgenic or transgenes in the wild. So in the beginning of the slideshow, I did talk a lot about biotechnology and how it works within medical research, but we also have um, transgenes in our crops and uh, out in the wild today. So I do kind of want to talk about how that works. Um, so glycophosphate resistant transgenic, <laughs> transgenic plants are widely known and they're also widely grown because they are unharmed when sprayed with the herbicide glycophosphate which is the active ingredient in what we call Roundup. So Roundup is something that um, negatively affects not only um, the plants within our yards and things like that, the animals that live in that uh, environment, but also Roundup ends up in our uh, water system. It ends up down our sewers. It gets into our rivers and streams and kills off a lot of the natural um, organisms that uh, need to be within our water and within our um, you know, soil and things around us. It's a very harmful ingredient. So glycophosphate is uh, the active ingredient there. So basically farmers have created glycophosphate resistant transgenic, farmers and scientists have created transgenic plants that are resistant to glycophosphate, um, the active ingredient Roundup. So basically farmers can then go around spraying this herbicide all over their um, fields and it will kill all of the weeds and it will allow their actual crop that is resistant to live through it. Um, but there are issues with that. So cross-pollination of those glycophosphate resistant plants and weeds lead to then glycophosphate resistant weeds. Um, so basically we end up with plants and weeds that can both now withstand Roundup or glycophosphate. Um, so that's a negative, obviously. Glycophosphate resistant weeds are shown to be reproductively advanced over normal weeds as well. So they not only can be resistant to Roundup, but now they're taking over the weeds that we can kill. Um, so glycophosphate resistant weeds had a higher seed germination. So um, they're actually able to germinate and grow at a, a rapid pace. Um, they also produce more of those seeds and they grow faster. So um, this image here is an example of uh, glycophosphate resistant transgenic maize. So maize is actually uh, commonly known as corn. So that's a corn crop. Um, so basically they're spraying uh, this glycophosphate resistant, um, you know, spray on the plants. So here we have the protein is not there. We have a regular crop and weed. Here we do have the protein. So by spraying this Roundup, now we're killing the regular crops and we're, um, we have a Roundup ready crop is what we call it, or a glycophosphate resistant crop here. Um, but then we end up with glycophosphate resistant weeds. So this is not something that stops um, just within the one plant. Plants cross pollinate, uh, whether they're 
pollinating with other corn plants or maize plants, or they're pollinating with weeds. Um, so it is something these transgenes actually are in the wild in the sense that um, they may be created either in a lab or intentionally by farmers, but they're actually um, now kind of doing the opposite of what we intended. Um, so they are also making those weeds that we were trying to kill resistant to uh, Roundup and glycophosphate. So now we're to the end of our slideshow and we're gonna discuss the key takeaways like always. So number one is transgenic organisms or genetically modified organisms, GMOs, contain DNA from another species to generate proteins. Number two is that GMOs provide a lot of benefits, but they also raise a lot of concerns. And number three is discussing the seven components of biotechnology and genomics. So those components are PCR, and we know that a PCR makes DNA copies very fast, and it can make it from um, a very small portion of DNA into millions of copies of that DNA. Um, number two is stem cells. We talked about them. Stem cells can generate any type of cell, so they are important for biomedical research. They're also very controversial. Um, cloning is also very controversial, but it's the third of our components. Uh, it generates an organism with identical genetic code. So it happens a lot within bacteria. It doesn't happen a lot or at all within mammals, um, but it is possible. Uh, so number four here, DNA sequencing we talked about, and it reveals the order of base pairs. Um, and DNA sequencing is, we talked about um, gel electrophoresis as the example. Um, and then number five is DNA probes. So we talked about probes. They're able to bind to complementary sequences of DNA in order to, for example, identify something like CF, um, cystic fibrosis within the body. So basically they're kind of able to help medically um, determine whether someone is positive for a gene or not. Um, number six is PGD and it tests for uh, test the IVF or in vitro embryos before implantation. So basically PGD, we test for um, any kind of negative uh, potential disease later on before uh, the embryo is in inserted into a woman's uterus. Um, and then number seven is gene therapy. And gene therapy, once again, has the potential to replace faulty genes within people who are already adults, for example, um, but it also has a lot of potential side effects. So um, yeah, do all you can to remember these things about the seven components of biotechnology. Um, biomedical research is advancing at a rapid rate. There is so much positivity that can come from it. There is also a lot of controversy, so always do your research. Um, but yeah, I would like for you to understand these things before moving on. Thank you.